Hi, it's The Wire. Always, 1776.com, a free site. Also, wealthspinning.blogspot.com, a free site. Today is October 23rd, 2024. Nothing I say in this video should be construed as investment advice. I want everyone to do their own due diligence, to rely on their own financial resource, their financial advisors. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, it's just a sign of the times. Um, I'm part of an email group of longtime friends. I've known these guys for decades, right? And we're talking politics. And, of course, I'm the only person in the group who is not voting for Kamala Harris, right? This isn't a political diatribe. I'm just going to convey what was said and let the chips fall where they may. So a friend who knew that I had been trying to convince others in the group to invest in Bitcoin, gold, Dash, a cryptocurrency uh, that's popular in places like Venezuela, and silver. He, of course, uh, was telling me that I was selfish, that I didn't care about the little guy, right? That, you know, investing in gold and silver was really something the wealthy did, right? That, you know, Bitcoin was somehow evil because, you know, this is something that I guess BlackRock now has a spot ETF and institutional investors are pouring into the space. And this was coming from a guy, he's older than me. Um, he was uh, a guy I worked with at a law firm. He was one of the senior lawyers when I was there decades ago, right? And I was shocked because while I considered this guy to be pretty sharp, I realized he didn't understand basic economics. Right, I had to explain to him, um, I didn't even get into the fact that Bitcoin, um, really, <laughs> the genesis of Bitcoin is not Wall Street. It's Shitoshi Nakamoto. It's the coders who came up with a way to have limited supply, to have money, not currency. Right, to have really digital gold. I know Peter Schiff someplace is wincing, but you know, understand it's the outsiders, not the financial insiders who created Bitcoin. Right? Understand maybe now it's chic among institutional investors. It wasn't always that way. Right? Let me also point out too, you heard me mention Venezuela earlier in this conversation. Understand what gold and silver help you do, what Dash has done for Venezuela, what Bitcoin is doing for Venezuela and other countries with inflation problems. They're actually allowing everyday workers to hold on to the purchasing power of their earnings. That's what they're doing. So as the local government, Maduro, whoever, is debasing currency, because in the short term that gives the illusion of creating wealth, just understand you can't print gold. You can't print silver. They're limited supply. You can't you know, while you could debase gold by claiming something is pure gold when it's actually, you know, cut gold, less than 50% gold, just understand that if there's truth in advertising, you can't print gold. You're not dealing with the whims of politicians. 
people have it backward. Gold, silver, Bitcoin, the best altcoins, they help the common man. That's the advantage the common man has in the transaction. If I make a loan to you and it's in dollars, and you know that inflation's increasing, politicians have an incentive to debase the currency, you understand that to pay someone $6,000 for a child, $25,000 for that first home purchase, $50,000 if they start a business, aren't those the political promises being made right now in this election? You're going to have to print money. So if I lend you $100 and you pay me back in 100 watered down dollars, I've lost money on the transaction. But if I lend you $100 in gold and you have to pay me back in gold the same amount, then I'm not losing in the transaction. Well, an investor I follow, he's one of the best, uh, Jim Rogers. Please know that name, Google him. Let me also point out too that I recognize that my crowd here has a lot of young people. And I seem to have a face where young people come up to me. It, it, it's the oddest thing. I'll be hanging out. There'll be a lot of old people around. Young people come up to me with questions about sports and finance. Right? They don't even know who I am. I think it's just, you know, I look like a friendly person. Well, young people haven't lived through market downturns. They have certain beliefs that are unproven in history. Jim Rogers believes that one of the lessons of history is that many investors don't learn from history. So let's talk about history. Let's talk about examples. Let me make a point here. I want people to track the share price of Cisco, right? Understand, the internet has changed a lot of lives. Can we agree on that? Cisco, of course, router company, was perfectly positioned. Perfectly positioned to take advantage of the explosion of the internet. Right? Cisco, of course, took off at first. It was one of the must-have stocks. If you're a young person, please just pull up the chart of Cisco. Look at where Cisco was in 1999. And look at where it is now. The internet, no doubt, is a runaway success. I'm making this video for an internet platform, YouTube. Right? I'm sure many of us are living lives that are vastly different than we were living in 2000. The internet was a game-changing technology. Cisco was an integral part of the internet's success. But folks, the stock has lagged. I want you to draw the analogy to AI. AI can be a big success. That doesn't mean that the perfectly situated AI players are going to grow in share price exponentially. Right? A lot of the expectations may already be built in to the price. Well, let's talk about another idea that people just don't know history about. I've spoken to more than one young person and they believe that bonds are a sure thing. Right? What could possibly go wrong? If I have a T-bill, understand the entity that owes me money is the United States government, right? If I have an American T-bill, right? Then I'm owed by the United States government, not some startup that could go BK, 
not some private player that could go BK. No, I'm literally owed by the United States government an entity that can actually print dollars, create dollars. Right? Think about it. So let's go back to February of 1994. I want people to understand the importance of the Fed funds rate. When the Fed is doing things like cutting rates or increasing rates, amateurs shrug their shoulders. They say, oh, okay, the Fed cut rates. All right, good for us. There's more money, right? Players figure out how to be a player. Players understand that rate cuts and rate hikes can have devastating impacts. That profitable investment you made could actually suddenly be underwater. So let's go back to February of 1994. I'm just going to tell you the bond market, as things played out back then, lost over a trillion dollars. That's how serious it is. So let's say the Fed funds rate was 3% in February of 1994. Let's say that I think I'm smart. So I bought a six-month T-bill that paid 3.25% on an annual basis. Right? So I'm thinking, okay, the Fed funds rate's 3%. I'm getting 3.25%. I'm ahead of the game. My money is making money for me. Right? Isn't that the mindset? Right? Your your peers don't know about the bond market. They're clueless. You know about the bond market. You're in the bond market and you're thinking, oh, great. I'm going to make a profit here. Here's what happened. Believe it or not, back in February of 1994, we had inflation. The Fed needed to address it, right? The cost of debt became risky. So the Fed started hiking the Fed funds rate. By the end of the year, the Fed funds rate was 5.5%. So let's say you bought a six-month T-bill when the Fed funds rate was 3% and you were getting 3.25%. Well, as the Fed hiked rates past the 3.25%, player, you were underwater. Think about this too. Once the market passes you by, right? In other words, I've lent money and I'm getting a 3.25% annual rate and now suddenly the you know, rates being offered by bonds is higher than my 3.25. Where am I going to go? Right? So I call you up and I try to sell you my bond. Right? Understand, nobody wants a bond that's paying less than market. Understand, the value of your bond is going to drop. Right? So... In 1994, many bondholders who thought they were balling found themselves passed by, by the market. The value of their bonds dropped. The quality of the debtor who owed them money, the United States government, didn't matter. They were losing money. Right? All told, in 1994, bondholders lost over a trillion dollars, not a billion, a trillion dollars. Now let's talk about the reverse. We all want that hot new stock. We all hope to beat the market, right? We want something like maybe a 10% rate of return if the investment is successful and you understand some investments are not going to be successful. Right? You know, there's a saying, the
The market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So, just understand, after a decade rife with inflation, where the stock market was flat, in the early 80s, Paul Volcker decided to raise interest rates. He, he was the Fed chairman. He decided to raise interest rates to address inflation. But when you raise interest rates, that decreases the money supply. Well, just understand, right? Eventually, price levels come down because no one can afford the inflationary prices. So understand what happened. Believe it or not, in 1981, the yield on the 10-year Treasury, this was back when, unlike now with an inverted yield curve, you actually got more interest on longer duration debt. Right? Think about that. Don't fall in love with inverted yield curves, folks. That's temporary. So in 1981, believe it or not, the yield on the 10-year Treasury and here again, your debtor, the person paying you money, you're the creditor in a bond transaction. Your debtor is the United States government. They're going to make the payment. This is the best entity to have as a debtor. Right? They're not going to declare bankruptcy on you. At least let's hope they don't. Well, just to understand, your yield each year for 10 years was 15.84%. Now, folks, understand, this isn't theoretical. Right? To young people who weren't alive in 1981, folks, I'm not theorizing on some scenario. I'm actually telling you what actually happened. Right? If you had this 10-year treasury, the government was paying you a yield of 15.84% on that investment. Right? Think it through. The point of this video is just to point out that you can lose money investing in bonds. You can also make a lot of money investing in bonds if you know how to do so based on interest rate moves. Then you're a baller. Right? I'm just telling you, you have blue collar criminals out there risking 20 years in prison, robbing banks to make a few extra dollars. And then you have baller types who can assess inflation rates, can model in what they believe will be the Fed's reaction to the inflation rates to address inflation, and then who can make money simply by buying things like bonds. Right? Understand, too. This is different than buying stocks. Stocks, I'm betting on some entrepreneurs. I'm betting on some company that has people who are customers buying their goods. Right? Let's name a hedge fund investment, right? Bill Ackman, uh, one of his hedge fund plays, which is Chipotle. Right? I'm banking on. You know, Chipotle not having an E. coli scare like McDonald's has just had. I'm banking on people still showing up. There's a lot of fragility there, right? People still showing up and spending their money at a restaurant instead of trying to save it by eating at home. I'm banking on there being no labor strife. I'm banking on there not being some crazy person who walks into a Chipotle with a firearm and starts shooting at people 
like folks used to walk into post offices years ago. I'm banking on a lot. There's a lot of risk involved in the stock market. Right? Investors are taking that risk. No, in the bond market, I'm lending money to the government. <laughs> you know, the, the idea is that the government's going to pay me back. They have a higher credit rating than Chipotle or any of these private companies or publicly traded companies. Right? My point to you is the risk is so great in society, in America, that even the bond market is fragile. That 3.25% that you're getting, that you know is above the Fed funds rate, might by the end of the six months, which is a short duration investment vehicle, might be underwater. Right? Let's talk about investment ideas. Well, in fact, what I'll do is go more macro than that. Just talk about themes. The first theme, folks, is that the Buffett indicator, please Google that. The Buffett indicator is clearly showing that the stock market is overvalued. Now, you have things like blow off tops. You understand that the end of the 1920s, please Google that era, was a go-go era, right? The 1920s was an affluent decade, right? By the end of the 1920s, oh my goodness, the good times were never going to stop. The stock market was rocketing. You had all kind of new technologies out there. Then, of course, we end up in the Great Depression, right? It was crushing. You need to think of the current era as analogous to the late 1920s. Understand, at the end of a multi-year party, everyone thinks the punch bowl is still full. Everyone is still partying, right? Well, what I want people to do is to realize that the stock market is overvalued based on historical metrics. If you want to hear a line that time and time again has been proven wrong, just keep this in your head. That line is, this time is different, right? Every generation thinks that this time is different, that the paradigm has shifted, that with a technology as groundbreaking as the internet, a well-positioned company like Cisco can't have its stock price lag not for six months, not for a year, but for several years. Several. Right? Groundbreaking technology and usage doesn't necessarily mean that the stock prices of the players are going to grow exponentially. How do we know that? We know that from history. So let me just say, just some themes. The stock market is historically overvalued. Let's talk about another market that's overvalued. You know this right now. If you're in the condo market in Florida, right, the housing market is hopelessly overvalued. By the way, not just here. Look at the housing market in Australia. Look at the housing market in Canada. Let me say, the way these things crater, and I lived through the 2008 housing crash, right? I understand some young people watching this video might not have. Talk to the people who lived through 
these crashes. The way these things work is you always hear about some market that you don't think is analogous to your market. Real estate has already crashed in China. Just Google Evergrande. Now I agree. The real estate finance system in China is very different than real estate finance in, let's say, America. I'll agree with that. Right? But don't kid yourself. A lot of Chinese investors who were invested in Chinese real estate also held real estate in places like Vancouver, places like Toronto, parts of Southern California. If they're real estate back home craters, then they have less money to buy real estate in those markets. Right? Fires at the edge of a market tend to spread. Let me also say this too. You know, the politicians were slow on crypto, right? It was very late in this election cycle that suddenly Donald Trump, who was a crypto investor himself, right, realized that he needed to fully embrace crypto. He needed to talk about how he wanted to replace Gary Gensler as the chairman of the SEC, right? He had a conversation with a younger person. Vivek, who told him, look, central bank digital currencies, which the Biden administration had us headed toward, were a terrible idea, right? That not all digital currencies were analogous. That you wanted non-governmental, decentralized, limited supply cryptocurrency. Kamala Harris then joined Donald Trump. This is late in the cycle the election cycle, to say, hey, I embrace crypto. Um, we're going to make sure that the United States has a competitive edge on cryptocurrency over the world. Right now, you and I know, particularly looking at Trump's family's latest cryptocurrency venture, that it's possible that neither Trump nor Kamala Harris understand the crypto market, right? It's possible that they don't understand that a lot of crypto mining is done outside of the United States, right? You understand that it's the people in crypto who might know much more about crypto than either Donald Trump or Kamala Harris. Right, so my point to you is understand these politicians often get it wrong. Let me talk about one such wrong decision. I'm in California. Now there was a time when I was in college, I don't think I would have been able to make it through college if it wasn't for fast food. Right, there was a time where you could buy a burrito, a carne asada burrito that would feed you for days, for days. Uh, and you could pay seven bucks for it, right? I'd go into McDonald's and I knew, I knew that I could get two cheeseburgers and a soda and I'd be paying something like three bucks. I had a friend from the Philippines. He came to the United States and he said, man, you know, the one thing that's so great about the United States is the cheap food. Well, of course, it's during flush times. It's during times where the market's at record highs that people think that this abundance, <laughs> these price levels, including labor prices, Wages are going to last forever. So here you have a market, the fast food market, where a lot of the customers are starving students or families with limited means who are trying to stretch a buck, right? Isn't the slogan for McDonald's, you deserve a break today. And the powers that be have decided to legislate 
$820 an hour minimum wage for fast food workers in the state. Folks, that's preposterous. What happened to the concept of an entry-level job? Right, folks, you understand what's going to happen. The labor market's already softening. You understand stock prices will not be able to stay at record levels forever. You've had some stock market crashes where the stock market has dropped 40%. Isn't that what happened in 87? Stock markets dropped 40%, right? I'm just telling you the way the world works, right? A lot of people suddenly found themselves a lot poorer. They start cutting back on their discretionary spending, including going to McDonald's. Let me also point out that things change, right? At full employment, you want to get paid what you believe you're worth. When several people on your block during less than full employment are unemployed, when you yourself have been unemployed for a while and you get offered that job at 30% less than you had hoped, many people with bills, with kids, with obligations are going to make that payment, excuse me, are going to make that sacrifice. Suddenly, wages are going to start dropping in the economy. So this living wage idea, folks, that's some political construct. We're going to enter a time where folks are going to look at the $20 an hour fast food job. And they're going to ask themselves, gee, why are those workers getting paid that much? It's even worse than that. McDonald's, a restaurant with a Big Mac with a quarter pounder with cheese, with a double quarter pounder with cheese, has been selling a $5 meal. You and I know the burger they're giving you is not close to a Big Mac. Right? Understand, consumers are so strapped that these restaurants have to offer you non-signature food at discounted prices to get you in the door. Isn't Wendy's right now? allowing you to buy any size soda for a dollar. Right? They're desperate to get you in the door. And while they're operating at the margin, well-meaning but deluded and confused politicians are mandating that they pay burger flippers $20 an hour. It's ridiculous. Right? So just understand, you're going to have some markets crumble. I'm expecting housing in real dollars, not nominal dollars, but real dollars, to ultimately drop at least 30, 35%. Right? Young people know that their parents bought their houses for a far lower multiple of their annual salaries than the going prices right now. Right? You know that. Many young people are looking at houses and they're saying, gee, why would I buy a house in my neighborhood when I can rent and get a commensurate living situation for far less? Leaving me money to actually go out and use to buy Bitcoin, gold, silver, premium altcoins. Right? Which, of course, are appreciating in value. Not depreciating like a house with, of course, the carrying costs of a house. Property taxes, for example. So, that's how I see it today. Please pay close attention to things like the Buffett Indicator, the Schiller P.E. Ratio, history. Right? Let me just say that in an earlier video, I talked about how AI, one of the bullish parts of AI, 
is going to be energy. Since I made that video, understand, Amazon has announced multiple nuclear power deals, right? A deal with Energy Northwest uh, to develop a nuclear facility in Washington. They are now also openly investing in small modular reactors, SMRs. Folks, nuclear energy has changed. These SMRs are going to start popping up all over the country. One very good way to play AI is to invest in viable SMR making companies. Google has signed an agreement with Kairos Power to purchase energy from SMRs. Right? Understand, Amazon, Google, these are Goliaths. They come up with a regimen of purchasing power from SMRs. That's going to fuel the SMR industry. Understand, too, that Microsoft recently entered into a 20-year deal with Constellation Energy to buy power from a soon-to-be-reopened Three Mile Island. Right? We were so delusional at the end of the 1970s that we were afraid of nuclear power. Folks, just understand, because of the energy demands of AI, of EVs, of crypto, nuclear power is back with a vengeance. I previously recommended that people consider buying Cameco. Um, look up that symbol. Um, and what you want to do is to just be aware of the macro. Right? Some old timers like me might still be afraid of nuclear energy. Do your own research. Don't listen to us. Right? Look at what Amazon, Google, Microsoft are doing. Look at the energy demands of AI. Right? If you find that they're outsized, then I believe you need to uh, pay close attention. Uh, and make the moves that you need to make. Let me close by saying, you know, now is the time to prioritize dividends. Right? We all understand that New Jacks, you know, say dividends. Come on, I don't need them. My company is going to grow exponentially. Uh, I'll just you know, get the capital gains. I don't want my company paying me dividends. I want them putting the money in R&D, right? Isn't that the swashbuckler mindset? Folks, you can't have the swashbuckler mindset when you have a market that is as overpriced as this one, according to the Buffett indicator, right? Don't analogize this market to a properly valued market, right? Take the dividends, take a company like Exxon. You know, just understand, uh, I'm an Exxon shareholder. From time to time, I come across articles where they're saying, oh, you know, a barrel of oil is decreasing, right? Now, I don't know who these yahoos are writing these pieces. Anytime you have as many military conflicts as you have right now around the globe, Right? I thought we were sanctioning Russia for invading Ukraine. I thought Israel was going through Gaza and, you know, was killing, um, you know, the head of uh, Hamas and stuff like that. Right? Anytime you have military conflicts, you have energy uncertainty. Right? People still need to drive their cars, don't they? When you have energy uncertainty, you're going to have really a floor to how low gas prices can go. I mean, think about it. Our strategic petroleum <laughs> reserve is still not full, right? Biden emptied it to, you know, help look good for the midterm elections. It still hasn't been replenished. Well, what people need to understand is that a company like Exxon, above and beyond the actual state 
of the energy market actually pays a very good dividend, has a several year history of doing so. In these uncertain times with a stock market as overbought as this stock market is, you need to focus on dividend paying companies like Exxon. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.